Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind bucklers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp for you.com mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I meet today with Havy Buzo, and Havy is a journalist, TV host, podcaster, and blogger. And uh, what Havy does, she focuses on the Middle East, the cultural tensions in the regions, the politics, and uh, whatever else is going on there. So, welcome to the Judgment Call podcast, Havy. Great to have you. Thank you, Torsten. I'm excited to be with you. Hey, absolutely, absolutely. It's great to have you here. So, you know what? I'm surprised that you chose the Middle East as your um, area of expertise, because for a lot of us, it's something where we feel like both sides in this conflict it might be way more than just two sides. They are stuck in this eternal conflict, and from the outside, it always seems like there's not much you can do. It's it's something that has for millennia its own dynamic. And from the outside, especially seen from the U.S., it's a little bit of a it's a game where you can virtue signal, but actually you can't do much about it. Um, so how did you get there and how did this, your work actually start and what impact do you feel you're making right now? Um, I mean, let me start with uh, if I chose to focus on the Middle East, it's the opposite. I, the Middle East chose me because I was born in the region. So, um, And I've been interested in politics since I was uh, a child because my father was always interested in politics. And sometimes it bothers me. Like, why do I have to be focused on this region um, that has, as you said, millennia of wars? Um, things don't seem to get any better. Um, and at the same time, why am I always focused on politics? And it's just one of my... Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've had another conversation. I was saying that maybe it's a weakness. You know, it's just like I have, I am drawn to politics. I'm interested in the world and what's happening in the world. And I have absolutely believed that the Middle East is very important uh, for us as Americans, for the United States, for the rest of the world. I mean, the history uh, of religions, uh, the history of uh, civilization is all started in the Middle East. And I don't think that we should ever compromise on that part of the world, um, regardless you know, of what happens in Washington. And we know that there's a swing that happens between different administrations. Uh, one could be more focused or one is less focused and there's a price for that. So um, I, I think we can you know, continue the conversation on this uh, topic, but uh, absolutely this is um, you know, part of my DNA is just to care and focus uh, on the Middle East. Yeah, I mean, the Middle East is definitely very, very interesting. So I think you, you've done well there and it won't go out of business. Like the conflict in the Middle East will never go out of business. So it's a it's a choice um, in that respect um, to find content um, as a journalist. I think that's that's going to help um, 
over the years. And whenever I learn about the Middle East, um, you know, I've, I've, I've read the major um, religious books um, myself. And when I travel to the Middle East, there, there is this, this cradle of humanity is not just empty. I mean, this is where most of the civilizations came from. This is where all the big religions came from, with a few exceptions like Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism, if you want to call this a religion. Um, what do you think, from a historic perspective, what do you think made the Middle East so special at the times? You know, this was a couple of thousand years ago, but I mean, it seems to be something that is this, this continuous impact on the rest of the world. What do you think is it in the Middle East? Is it the, the, uh, the geography? Is it just pure luck? Is it the people? Is it some alien divine inspiration that actually happened? What do you think helped the Middle East to be so much ahead in terms of cultural knowledge than anyone else in the world? Um, so going back, historically speaking, I mean, uh, you know, civilization started in the Middle East. The Middle East is the center of civilizations. I mean, even if you look at it geographically, it's the connection between the East and the West. So um, it's no coincidence, in my opinion, uh, not to mention that, you know, in, in our beliefs in Judaism and uh, all of the world religions, the main world religions, uh, as you mentioned, there are exceptions, of course, but um, started in the Middle East. Um, and uh, of course, that led to things and wars happening where there was some religions who did not accept uh, other religions. And there was, uh, it's a, basically a history of conflict that you know started because of that lack of acknowledgement and acceptance of uh, and respect of you know if having a being a, in a smaller uh, religious group uh, that does not want to convert others and you know and when I talk about Judaism in this example uh, a religion that is uh, a, has a smaller group of people because it does not believe that it has to go out there and convert others. Um, but because of that, it was picked on by bigger religions that believed that they wanted to, you know, maybe uh, tell others that they should convert to their religion. So, and, and there's a history of that. And then there was always a history of um, dominant powers who went to the Middle East. Um, and in the in, if we talk about Judaism, because I want to kind of connect it to that, um, the Babylonians. I mean, that's even before Christianity um, and Islam. The Babylonians came and destroyed the first temple. Then you had the Romans come in and destroy the second temple. So it was always foreign powers. And um, I do believe that in the, we are in a place where we have to find a solution for this. Um, I am unlikely like you're saying like it's kind of like a business that, oh, there's always conflict in the Middle East, we can cover it, but it's actually time that this changes. And there are promising things that are happening right now. And I think to me as a journalist, as somebody who was born in a region, I'm very optimistic. Um, I do get scared when I see you know, what's happening in Washington, because I believe in the importance of the American role in anything positive to happen in the Middle East, um, because there are uh, evil powers out there that do not want to have stability. They do not want to have peace um, and they have their own agendas. So the United States as the force for good uh, has a very important role to play. Um, and I do get concerned when I see, you know, the kind of the right versus left and how there's a swing in policies. And uh, now we have a new president in the White House, which I want to give the benefit, benefit of the doubt. I want to see uh, this administration uh, carry out good policies uh, in the interest of the people in the Middle East. Uh, but there are concerns. So that we are looking to see what's going to happen. But definitely as a journalist covering this, uh, those are the things that I care about is having an, a, a strong American leadership uh, to help um, these countries in the Middle East keep going forward because there was milestones that happened in the last few years under uh, the, uh, Biden, no, the Biden, the Trump administration. I know a lot of people wouldn't like to hear this, but those are facts. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we, I'd love to go into some of the politics there. there I'm, I'm just curious about them. I lived for some time in Israel and I, I, I find it hard to understand the local politics coming into that um, politic, political game at the time, I felt, but maybe there's more to it. So I'm really curious to dive a little bit more into it. Um, 
give me give us a better idea of you know you grew up in Syria and I know Syria like Lebanon and I spent some time in Lebanon is a country a lot of people don't know that that's relatively rare because it's about half um, Christian it's half Muslim and it's pretty much divided by north and south um, it's not that easy but in like in the capital in Beirut um, you see um, huge churches having huge church bells going all over the city the sound is massive and beautiful and then the mosque is right next to it and has equally strong sounds so it really seems like to the to the occasional visitor there's a, there's a competition for the hearts and minds is going on right there like in the middle of downtown um, Beirut and I found this fascinating. Not a lot of places have that ability in the Middle East and outside the Middle East to have two religions that are kind of at odds with each other's throat to be relatively peaceful. And I know Israel has that too. It has a strong Islam, um, Muslim population uh, besides the Jewish population. And you grew up in Syria, and I think this is a similar situation, so I don't know enough about Syria, I have to admit, because nobody can travel there anymore. When I was old enough to travel, it kind of became um, um, entrenched in the civil war. Um, help us understand how you grew up in in Syria and how they how this plays out in Syria. Is it similar to to Lebanon? I mean, in terms of that's absolutely the case. Uh, but in Syria, the dominant uh, population is a Muslim population. Um, Christians were basically. Uh, I mean, slowly, uh, there was a less Christian population in Syria, and obviously the Jewish population as well. Um, and when I was born in Syria, there was a regime in place that continues to be in place today that is a, a dictatorship, uh, a socialist bloody dictatorship that uh, did not give its people any freedom, that empowered Islamism. Um, I remember growing up, my parents will always complain about the fact that there are more and more mosques everywhere. That they're, they're, this regime was always building more mosques um, while it claims that it's fighting ex Islamic extremism. So it was actually empowering uh, Islamic extremism because that was the boogie man that wanted to th threaten the people with eventually down the line, which is exactly what happened. Um, so, um, you know, there are people in the middle, in Syria, there are intellectuals uh, that are free minded, free thinkers. But they're afraid of the regime. And my parents happen to be, you know, one of these uh, few families in Damascus. And I grew up uh, in a household where, where, you know, we had parties, we had gatherings, people would talk politics. Obviously, not a lot of people agreed with my parents, which were unique in their outlook on the world. My dad saw the United States as a force for good, and that was something unspeakable in, in Syria, uh, even by the you know so-called intellectuals. Uh, always wanted peace with Israel, which is also was unspeakable. Um, so there's a lot of things that my parents were unique uh, in, in their perspective on things. Uh, but there was Christians, there are Alawites, there are Jews, there are certain different minorities. Uh, my mom grew up in the Jewish quarter in Aleppo, but throughout her life, she lost all of her friends and neighbors because they were escaping and leaving in the middle of the night uh, because they were afraid of what the Ba'ath party was doing. To the community. So um, it's less and less minority in Syria and it's more and more Muslim dominant uh, country. And obviously there's the Arab nationalist identity, there's the Muslim Sunni identity, there's the Alawite identity. So there's a lot of competing identities and there's a regime that is just there to control everybody and hush everybody and whoever is not hushed is basically disappeared. Yeah. That, I mean, not a lot of people know about Syria or the inside of Syria. I mean, me included, right? And that was always, always was described to me as for people who were able to go to Syria as the best place in the Middle East because of their food, because of the people who live there, because of the, the openness to an extent that it probably had some time ago in terms of religious freedom and how people interacted with this. And well, maybe you know the answer to this because that has struck me the whole time. Most places in the world, there is a certain battle going on, say the battle between the U.S. and Mexico, right? And you can think from both ways about this, um, how we kind of annex California. And uh, there's been a war and then, you know, everyone got settled and that was fine. And nobody is worried about this anymore, even in Mexico, right? And uh, people are interested in coming to California now, from Mexico maybe, but there is no, no the, the idea of a hot war be, between Mexico and uh, and uh, the U.S. a hundred years later is, is impossible. Nobody even thinks about that. 
But when you go back to the Middle East, there's literally a wall or a tree or a little rock. And in Jerusalem, we see this perfectly, but that's also true um, the borders with Israel or the borders with Lebanon. And there, for 2,000 years, under continuous attack, who does it belong to? And I, there's this story in the Bible that we see, and there's a story in the Quran. We really need this rock. Why do you think the parties, for some reason, they, they don't move on to the next stage and say, okay, okay, we've lost this territory, that's sad, but let's build our economy, let's focus on something that belongs to the future. Why is there this focus on symbols or, or, or ideas out of religion? Or what is it exactly in the Middle East? And well, what is it a psychological thing? Or is it that people are misled? Or is it economically? Well, why is that? Well, absolutely, people have been misled. And there's propaganda to promote hate and war. And that's been happening for decades. Uh, absolutely, this is a major part of why you see a lot of hate in the Middle East. I'm talking about the Arab side specifically because in Israel there's free press, uh, you see the left and right, uh, there's a dialogue, there's a debate. In the Arab side, it's state-sponsored media, state-sponsored education, and it's all leading in one direction. Um, completely refusing to acknowledge the Jewish history in the region, the Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. All of these things are completely denied. They're not even speak, spoken. Um, there's a, a certain, um, you know, I don't know how long that is like probably uh, one aspect of the history of the region that has been taught in schools in a lot of slogan, slogans and dogma and propaganda to promote the continuation of war, continuation of hate, um, and basically demonizing anybody who would think otherwise. Not only demonizing, persecuting. I mean, this is, it's been ongoing. Uh, when you talked about Mexico and California, I mean, I actually, I had a live, I, I was starting and I, there's something I'm going to be starting soon, uh, which is going to be a live streaming show. And I actually want to do it in Arabic to talk to people in the region. Um, where I, People ask me, what do you think of the Golan Heights? Because I was born in Syria, what do you think of, you know, that Israel basically now, the Trump administration acknowledged it as an Israeli territory. And I, I, to me, it was kind of like, you know, going back to your question about California, you want to ask the people who live in that place, who do they rather live under? A democracy that is giving them services, that's providing them freedoms and rights, or do they want to live under a dictatorship, a corrupt system that is a failed system that is depriving its own citizens of everything? So it's like, to me, it's very simple. Like, ask the people in the Golan, and maybe there are some of them who are going to say, oh, no, we want to live under the Assad regime, and maybe they should. <laughs> but as somebody who grew up under the Assad regime, um, as an American, and when I crossed the border, I actually used to live in California and I crossed the borders to Mexico. You know, it's, it's just you see the difference. There are systems in the world that uh, succeeded, that prevailed, that provided everything and a lot of the things, let's not say everything, a lot of the things that people deserve to have. And there are other countries who are ruled by other forms of systems, other forms of governments who failed to provide these things. And it's basically people should have the right to choose under where do they want to be, who should rule them based on how successful uh, this body of government is or not. So I think that would be the answer to conclude, you know, the idea about both like the Golan Heights in California. <laughs> Yeah, that <clears throat> that's interesting. You, <clears throat> I assume you, you speak Arabic, um, Hebrew, English. I don't speak Hebrew. I want to okay. learn Hebrew, but I do not speak it. Yeah. So, what I'm trying to get at is when you, and that's going into the histories of religion. <clears throat> and when I read the Quran, I I was going in with low expectations. I thought, whoa, this is just you know, it's something a mix up of what you see in the Old Testament. And what I saw is, um, is something really beautiful, something poetic, and something that appeals to to a sense of comfort, to a sense of doing the right thing. And um, it, it's the, the, the current incarnation, I think, of, of, of the Quran and how Muslims um, see their faith is very uh, very orthodox. It's very close to uh, you know the like a priest should behave, not necessarily how like the citizen should behave. And I always felt. 
Or if some people have maybe ideas and you, you study the region so well, why did that happen? Why did the Quran become way more orthodox? And um, the other religions, and you know, Christianity obviously had a, that the easiest spot. It was never that orthodox in the beginning. Maybe it had some monasteries, but most of the time it, it had a lot of freedom that it allowed, at least in the core, um, if you're not a priest. What do you think? What, and I think this is, this is my personal um, um, opinion on this, is that Islamic countries have trouble with things like democracy, which are not very Muslim to speak of. They're not very Christian either, so to speak. But there's a stronger uh, connection to the original Greek ideas of democracy. I think a lot of places have, they're not in love with democracy. They don't think it's the best tool. Um, and they, they, they shouldn't. I think the American values that we have that are essentially, you know, refined New Testament ideas, um, refined with capitalism, uh, Bloch and Adam Smith. Um, I, I love how you say democracy is the right tool, but I think for the locals, even if they maybe vote for something we saw this in Egypt, right, they could vote for the Islamist extremists in one year, and then two years later, they, they vote for something completely on the other side, kind of like Biden and Trump now. So we have these polarized choices. What I'm trying to get at, what do you think, how... In many Islam, Islamist countries, and you know, the UAE has, is the most modern, but it's still not exactly a democracy in most places. Do you really think this idea of democracy will catch on widely? Is that realistic? I feel like this is just not, it's not realistic in most Islamic places. Um, I think that's a very good question because to me, it's really about just providing the uh, most important things that a, every human being, it's like basically human rights that every human should have, which is, uh, you know, the ability to feed its family, the one, you know, being able to provide for their family, to have shelter, to have the rights for education, for jobs. It's basically services. And, you know, when you talked about democracy, this is a very important question because it's, it's basically what I believe is very important for human beings is the feeling of having the freedom more than the freedom itself. And let me tell you why I'm saying this. You see a lot of Americans today that grow up with so many conspiracy theories, they do not appreciate the democracy and the freedoms that they have here as Americans. They actually don't like the United States. They talk about it as if it is an evil force, as if it is a dictatorship, even though they have rights that so many people around the world would risk their lives to have. So it's they, they are free, but they just don't have the sense of being free. They don't believe that they are free. And that's... A, they've that's never a, earned it, right? They, they, they've never earned... They never did something for it. So if you don't earn it, if it, it you, you just, as a kid, you, you adjust yourself on the level that's there, right? You don't... You, there's no progress that they feel because it's like we have plumbing in our houses and nobody appreciates it, although it was that, that big deal 100, 200 years ago. Exactly. There's no basis of comparison. They yeah. don't really know how, what does it mean for them to live at, actually under a dictatorship? Um, you know, we see people who would be, you know, I want to talk about like Snowden or Assange. I mean, to me, like immediately when I look at somebody like this, you're going to hide in like, a palace that belongs to Putin, and you want me to believe that you are a whistleblower? I'm sorry, you're not, okay? When you are empowering and, and going to our adversaries who are actually evil, murderous regimes, you're not a whistleblower. You do, you're not standing up for anything. You're just selling uh, your own country to an actually an evil country, I mean, an evil regime. So to me, it's very clear uh, the, the divide because I grew up under a dictatorship. I have a basis of comparison. Um, but the Amer you know, some of these people don't. Just they heard the conspiracy theories, they believe that they're rebellious, um, and they just really truly don't like our our country and they do not appreciate it. So so I think it's it's that basis of comparison versus, you know, like we talk about other countries where people are don't have the basic needs for survival. And those people are the ones who, I mean, to me, as a person who is watching right now, I believe that what they deserve is to have these things that are basic human rights that every citizen of the world deserves. Um, and those are the things I think about first. And obviously education. 
um, because education is very important. People need to know and they need to know the truth and not propaganda that is sponsored by one corrupt dictatorship here or there. Um, you know, so, so I don't know if that answers the question. It does. I mean, it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a difficult question. And uh, what, what I can totally relate to you. I grew up under the Eastern German regime and uh, I saw it when I was very young. Um, so I didn't fully see the, the repressive effect as badly as, um, as others, but it still became apparent to me. And it's something that I cannot, I, I, this is so abstract, I can't tell my children about it. I, mean, I can tell them, but they don't understand what, what the difference to that is. They're like, whoa, there's a different city and there's many different cities. So these, these relatively abstract ideals, it needs a certain life experience and also a learning effect that you see progress in the world. Um, if, and you need to be 30 or 35 to really understand that. I think a lot of people who are younger, they can, they can parrot this, but they don't really understand what this is about unless they have a very traumatic experience. And I always want to send my children for two years to Ethiopia just so they appreciate America again. And I think it would help, but I don't know how I'm going to pull that off. And uh, so it is, it is difficult for people sometimes to see that w w what is better in the short term. In the long term, I think there's no doubt about it and people will, will realize that. But it might take 20 years, it might take 30 years. And by that time, you know, for a lot of people, their own life and their flexibility in life is basically gone. They, they have to be where they are. They can't just be a digital nomad. Not everyone can. I mean, I encourage people to be a digital nomad for a couple of years and just comparatively see the world. Well, but going back to what you said earlier, what do you think, of, you, you, you mentioned that um, in, in a very big way that the U.S. is a force for good, right? And um, so I'm curious what you feel, and you, you outlined that to an extent of what you think good is, but who are the forces in the region, do you feel, are forces for good that have adopted something that would really make lives of people in the region better. Are there people or are you still creating those people? Um, I would say Israel is a force for good in the Middle okay. East and around the world. Um, I see the countries that are making peace with Israel are making the right steps in the right direction. And that shows that these uh, countries, even though, like you said earlier, they're not actually democracies, but they are making the steps necessary to help their people and to help the region in the future. Um, they're going against what's been taught, what's been said for decades. That's not easy. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I have a lot of respect for the courageous leaders who did those uh, steps. And I wish for more um, leaders to follow um, in, from the Middle East. Um, Israel, I mean, I can talk about why I believe Israel is a force for good. Uh, not only that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, um, but Israel has a, a lot of innovations, high tech, uh, economical uh, bases and um, platforms that the whole region actually needs to survive in the future. You're talking about a region that relied on oil for decades. Um, the age of oil is soon to be gone. Um, there is, there's not even enough water, uh, agriculture. There are the, the destruction that is caused by the Iranian regime uh, that's been going on for decades. Israel, can, I mean, is, you know, I actually talked about this one time when I said, um, you know, the, the countries in the Middle East and these uh, governments and regimes have been looking all around the world to find allies because they want to fight Israel, because they hate Israel, because they want to destroy Israel. And then they one day woke up and realized that it was Israel all along that they needed to bring that region back to life. And that Israel was the element that was missing um, in the Middle East that was basically not allowed to just become and take its place in the Middle East. And that is why we have this imbalance and destruction that we've been seeing for so long. Um, so, you know, th this is what I believe in, not to mention that, um, I mean, there's so many organizations in Israel uh, who go all around the world to help. And there was like in Puerto Rico, there's so many organizations when there was a disaster there uh, in African countries. Israel is doing a lot of this already. Um, I just see that this is something uh, that the region really needs. And this is just when you make things right. It's basically uh, kind of putting the puzzle together. And this is finally happening. I just know that there are obstacles, 
the Iranian regime is still there. There are regimes that are connected to this evil force uh, in the region. Um, but I do see that things will hopefully be only getting better from this point. Yeah, I think the, the, the recent peace efforts in the region are called the Abraham Records um, or Accords. Uh, and um, I always felt when I was in the region, um, I was traveling a lot 10 years ago, I felt a lot of places, especially the UAE, it was very American, Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain, all the satellite states, Doha. And in many places, they resembled life in Israel a lot. Obviously, there's more mosque, and there's a slightly different overtone to this. But I felt the, the regions are already very close to each other because the UAE and the countries close to it, they had moved very similar into an American lifestyle. And so does Israel. You know, if you go to many places in Jaffa, um, it kind of could be in, in U.S. suburb, just with more European culture, you know, a bit like San Francisco, so to speak. And I always felt this was already on the books and I never understood and the behaviors of people and how um, it's kind of like Austria and Germany, you know, from the outside, they're kind of the same country. They always speak the same language. And you're like, whoa, these people should be friends, right? They're so similar, but they hated each other, right? They, they invaded each other all the time. And uh, so this, I always felt this about um, the many Arab countries, not all of them. And I finally see that they, they came together and now it seems like uh, nobody can really understand it why they were so at, at odds for so long. I mean, you can you can go through the reasons right intellectually, but actually, if you go in a, from a neighborly, you know, how many similarities do we share? You're like, well, why did we even, why did we were at some kind of war, a cold war mostly, for so long? And it's like, well, I don't even remember why we did this, right? It became this institution of looking at Palestine, looking at certain places that weren't we're more a propaganda tool, so to speak. And now people are like, so yeah, let's let's develop some weapons together against Iran. I mean, they go from zero to like, well, now we share intelligence, you know, which is kind of usually the last thing you do with the former enemy. Um, I found this really surprising that it, it wasn't really visible, right? It needed to reach this 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 point of 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 this boiling point, and then it suddenly changes so quickly. Um, do you think? This is going to stay that way, so this this piece is lasting and it's forever, or there's something else going on in two years that will all be rolled back because, say, the Biden administration will be very happy with Iran, and then we're going to be friendly with Iran, and then the UAE will not like this. That seems to be the current conflict, right? That's the UAE and Saudi Arabia against Iran. I mean, it's, it's basically an understanding that these countries are in the region. They have a common uh, present, common threats and common future. There's no escape from that. Yes, there was an exploitation of the Palestinians by Arab countries, where they, you know, the, the Palestinians who came to Syria, who came to, you know, all over, they were kept as refugees. When you look at the Palestinians in Lebanon, I heard horrifying stories about their treatment because these countries decided to keep using the Palestinians so they can keep um, having war and hate, an external enemy that they want to threaten their people with, and gave the Palestinians just the worst of education, everything. No education, uh, no passports or resident, like an actual citizenship where they can have their full rights like everybody else. It was just a continuation of the exploitation. I really, truly hope that all of these countries, they would come to a point where they would give the Palestinians equal rights obviously, and, and give them citizenships of the countries where they've been living for decades. Um, and for the Palestinians, I hope that they will vote out or somehow get rid of um, the Palestinian Authority, who's been doing nothing but exploit them, take the, all of the aid that was being uh, sent to them, refusing aid that doesn't you know, fit uh, their uh, criteria based on their... Um, ally, which is Iran, what Iran wants, but Iran doesn't want. Um, the same thing uh, in Gaza, Hamas, who is a terrorist organization. Both are basically allies of the Iranian regime, the Iranian regime that is slaughtering its own citizens, that has killed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people in Syria and Iraq and Iran and Lebanon. I mean, you are talking about just a very evil regime. And when I, you know, I, it's it's important that for whoever is listening to us today to understand this is, we're not talking about just, oh yeah, this is because it's like against the United States that we stand against it. No, this is a murderous regime that has been 
involved in uh, terrorism against the United States. It's actually been involved in 9-11 with thousands of American lives. Ayman al-Zawahiri, the second guy in Al-Qaeda, is still in Iran today. Um, Killed people in Syria just because they're Sunni and the Iranian regime is Shia. The same thing in Iraq. They killed all the Sunnis. They accused all the Sunnis of being ISIS and they killed them. Um, And they actually fostered and helped the uh, Sunni extremism. So those are the allies that the Palestinian leaderships have chosen. Um, And so so there is a very complicated situation. And to me, uh, the key is, is that each country in the Middle East should focus on the interests of their own people, on the prosperity and security of their own people, and uh, to make their own alliances based on that. Um, obviously, Iran is a major threat and continues to be a major threat. Now with the Biden administration in the White House, there are many people who are concerned. I am one of them. Not that I know what is going to happen, but we do see some names that are being picked that were part of the Obama administration team. That's very concerning for people in the Middle East uh, because during the Obama administration, we just saw a lot of destruction that happened because of the Obama policies. So we're just hoping when we look at the situation right now, for me as an observer, as an American, as a Middle Eastern, it's uh, concerning, and but we're definitely going to give the benefit benefit of the doubt to the Biden team and wish them the best of luck. We we'll just, you know, have to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, I find that that interesting. There's this typical left right divide that has been very much reflected in in the Middle East. So there is the, typically the left in the U.S. or anywhere in the world is very supportive of Palestine, is very supportive of Iran right now, which is a relatively new thing. Uh, we were, for 20 years ago, it was different. So it seems to be, irrespective of the facts on the ground, one side chooses their allies and the other side chooses their allies. And then the, you don't like the enemies of uh, your, your other friends, irrespective of these people or these countries might actually be good allies for you. And uh, what, what I wanted to get at, nobody really gave me a good explanation for this. <clears throat> When you see, look into the history, and this is a thousand years ago, right? So um, it's it's maybe not as relevant anymore. But originally, the Muhammad and the way the 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 uh, Saudi Arabia was run was run as a caliphate, and you know way better than me. Those all the the uh, the rulers um, of an Islamic um, state uh, needed to be a blood relative of Muhammad, right? It can be, and it still is true in Saudi Arabia many 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 generations later. And the Persians, the Shiites, relatively early said, this is weird, right? We, we're not going to have autocratic kings. We want some kind of control, some democratic control, how we elect our leaders. And they split up from the mainstream of Islam at the time. So when, when, you, when you see this, and you can easily interpret this as an early democracy movement, really, really early on, right? I mean, it's still a thousand years after the Greeks, but still. Um, and that's kind of the there's this core basis of technology, uh, not technology, but uh, since um, Islam was very successful in developing technology, they really prospered for a long time. And Persians prospered for the longest time, you know, for thousands of years, they controlled much of the Middle East. Why do you think a, a, a country with such a rich or a region with such a rich tradition of democracy, kind of different than other uh, Sunni Islamic um, places, why did, have they gone so far into, you know, state-sponsored terrorism? That's what you just accused them of, and I think a lot of people uh, accuse them of, and maybe they're guilty of that. I, I, I'm not a judge at all on that. Um, how do you think that happened? How do you come from a place that's, you know, admittedly many hundred years ago seems to be the birthplace of a, a democratic idea, and then you go into the op- completely opposite direction and become something that seems to be very polarizing against the U.S.? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, when you ask the question, if you're going to go back to the history, the Islamic kind of divide between the Sunni and Shia. Um, m- when we were little, my parents took us to Sid Zainab, which is like the Shia area where P- uh, Shiites would go and pray. And they showed us and we kind of covered our heads to just see it and everything. Because, you know, as my parents, we, you know, we're minority a minority of a minority, we sympathize with every minority, including Shia, because they were uh, persecuted in the Middle East. So, yeah. but the truth is, is that, you know, of course, uh, in countries like Saudi Arabia, there was the Wahhabism, which is a very militant way of Islam. So we saw a lot of violence and, 
you know, those countries had oil. So there was the extremist sheikhs, you know, that promoted uh, that specific uh, type of Islam. And then there's the Shia, which actually is the one that follows the bloodline because the split between Shia and Sunni is because the, and I'm, I'm sorry to prolong this explanation, but I believe yeah. is that it's um, somebody who is uh, from the Umayyad Khalifat or something, the Khilafah, they mm -hmm. killed Muhammad's grandson. Oh, okay. And then the Shia were the ones who were pro the bloodline of Muhammad. And that's why they kind of oh. against the Sunnis who were more political and they wanted to just kind of dominate based on, you know, the, the people who were ruling, not the bloodline of Muhammad. They did not. So it was, I think that was the, the, the split. Um, but it's Humanism. I mean, the Islamic revolution in Iran that happened in 1979 is what, you know, brought Iran into this, the, again, another militant form of Shia Islam that vowed the destruction of Israel, of the United States, um, that just hates everything the West stands for. Uh, and I, I mean, if there was like some historical uh, aspect about some form of democracy that was established from Shia or Sunni, I'm not aware of that. Um, you know, obviously Iran is has a history, the, the Persian Empire, there's a history there. Um, but that's completely, I mean, uh, you know, has nothing to do with what happened in 1979. And this is the regime we're dealing with, is a, a Islamic extremist regime that just hates everything the United States and the West stands for. And it's actually made its own people its primary enemies. And that's why the Iranian people are suffering from this regime. They've been suffering for decades. And every, almost every Iranian that's outside of Iran is anti this regime. Um, there are so many minorities in Iran uh, who are not Persian, that also have their own aspirations, that they wish to have their own self-ruling government body, which is what we were talking about earlier, that provides them the necessity, the, the importance and basic human rights that every person in this on this planet deserves. Um, and they all would like to be freed from this regime um, and have some you know, self-determination for their future. So um, I think this is what we're talking about here. This is not, you know, the West trying to change the regime in Iran or the government in Iran. No, this is an evil regime that is hated by its own people and that is hated by all of its neighbors because it committed vicious crimes and crimes against humanity. Yeah. Um, I want to I wanna move on to a slightly less emotional topic. So to speak. I can feel you. You're very, very uh, involved in that. Um, <laughs> usually, you're on the other side, right? You're the 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 opinionated or um, not so opinionated independent interviewer, and uh, you've been interviewing a lot of people about foreign politics, right? Um, what were your, your 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 most cherishable moments? You know, you you you've talked directly to people who've kind of shaped the world over the last 30, 40 years. But what really stands out and where do you feel like, well, this person I was was, was really amazed um, from from his public or her public persona, and then I realized, well, there's actually kind of a letdown. And vice versa, if you can be that honest, and, and vice versa, where you felt like, well, this person probably has not much to say. And it's like, well, I'm really impressed. It was like Jordan Peterson when you listen to him um, on YouTube. I, I'm not sure if I want to like name people and say that I was like, you know, um, I definitely had the moments where I was disappointed um, as an American, as a journalist, as a human being uh, with, you know, officials from the Obama administration when I was interviewing them. Just because, you know, that's like you said, I was talking about the Iranian regime and I'm consumed with emotion just because I've seen the severe injustice that the entire Middle East has been going through because of this regime and seeing those policies, those failed policies and this um, attitude that was, in my opinion, just very cold, very cold. And it does not represent our values as Americans. Um, again, the United States is the force for good. Uh, I would... To me, I mean, you know, without saying the, you know, the what's 
my personal view of a person or not. But when I interviewed John Kerry, I did ask him about why he was, for example, having those walks with Jawad Zarif. Um, you know, you're talking about a regime that you want to somehow say that uh, this regime is has this reform uh, front, which is Jawad Zarif, the uh, Iranian foreign minister, and um, you have Rouhani, which is the president. Everybody who's watching the Iranian regime knows that Khamenei is the one who rules, and he's the one who rules alone. Those people are just a, a front of the side. They're spokespeople. They're people who try to show the West, oh, that we have we have a reform side. That's like, but it's just a facade. So it is disappointing to me when I see American officials who understand what type of regime we're talking about, kind of say that there is like, oh, no, no, there are reformists. We saw that there was no reformists. Nothing has happened. There was the highest level of executions uh, from the Iranian regime under Rouhani uh, and Jawad Zarif uh, being their spokesperson. So so those are the things. But I mean, I've had other great um, interviews like the late uh, John McCain. Um, who's an American hero. I have so much respect. I've had so much respect for him. He was very inspirational for me when I interviewed him many times. Um, he's just a patriotic American who believes in our role in the world. And because I come from a different side of the world, I believe in that as well. And I know that when the United States retreats from the world, you have evil forces that come and fill in the gap. And we saw Iran being very, very empowered when Obama was in office. And then we saw Russia become very, very empowered. And now those two forces are coming into the region. We see that also China has been coming to the region and that's very, very dangerous. So we, this is very important. When the United States is not as strong and as tough, bad things happen in the world. And, you know, in life we have, this is a, a one life, a one shot thing. So we have to be careful in how we approach and handle these types of forces. I don't believe that these forces um, respond well to diplomacy and kindness and openness and niceness. They understand one thing. And that is force. Uh, one thing, and that is credible threat. Um, other than that, you're just going to lose the battle. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see you. You're hawkish on these topics, and um, I, I can see um, where you're coming from. My personal experience, you know, growing up with with, with communism and being convinced as a little kid um, that. Everyone on the other side of the border is basically a draggy and uh, looks at a very short lifespan. And it's basically, there's nothing out there but the vices of humanity. And uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the fear on both sides um, is very palpable and was very palpable. And I think the, the, I'm still surprised nothing happened when we never entered a nuclear war, which from my point of view could have happened any time. Both sides were kind of ready for it. And I'm, I'm very happy that it didn't happen. What I'm trying to say, it's still the right approach to talk to people. And uh, we know that um, it, people were very skeptical of talking to Iran because, as you say, it probably is not going to lead anywhere and these people are going to build a front. But on the other hand, you know, Donald Trump talked to North Korea, which was in the same league as Iranian layers. And um, we felt nothing happened. But I, I don't think talking to people is ever negative. Yes, people will, will not necessarily say, tell the truth. But if they do so, you can read this between the lines. So if, if, and that's why I don't believe in all these social media bans, do I think they will continue? If people have an opportunity to make their case, um, maybe not immediately, right? But over time, you will definitely realize, are they telling the truth or not? And it might take five years, it might take 10 years. This is not immediately clear most of the time, and it might, might make things a little more volatile. But I think having these things coming out and, and, and talking about them, it's good for all sides involved, even if there's a lot of propaganda. But, you know, I grew up with a lot of propaganda, but honestly, nobody really believed in this crap. Like, I, I, I had tons of, um, of, there were tons of newspapers, and they were completely propaganda, fully edited, right? Kind of like the New York Times right now. But after like five or ten years, people would use it as a toilet paper because that was the only thing that was good for. And these were even people like my, my parents. They were um, very well, um, very close to the regime, so to speak. But they didn't believe any of this thing either. And so nobody else, right? So there was this 90% of people who, who, who probably didn't believe in any of this. And 
um, the, the, the old Soviet republics like Eastern Germany, they went from being 100% core aligned with the Soviet Union to this one day when literally 90% of the population was on the streets. Like it, it only took a few days and then the regime was over. And it was very, very peaceful. And um, I think you, sometimes you have to wait these things out. And I admire how you, is this, you're very evangelical, right? You admire, you want to bring peace and the right thing to the world. And there's something very Christian behind this, right? Is this love for other people, but maybe with force, we have to force them to their own good destiny. But I think people I'm have to. Be, just the records. <laughs> yeah, you're right, but. I'm just curious, you're Christian or you're, you're Muslim or what, what are you your ethics? So I'm, I'm very religious, but I would rather not talk about my own religious beliefs. Oh, fair enough, fair enough. It's a Jordan Peterson excuse. Um, what, what, what I was trying to get at is I think it's a good idea to let people talk and then sooner or later something good comes out of it, even if you talk to a lot of liars, so to speak, but they will, they will put themselves, because lying is always more complicated than telling the truth, right? It's, 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 it's taxing on your brain and it's taxing on what on being consistent over time. It's almost impossible. Um, and there is a force for good, but people need to be ready to, to appreciate that force for good. And I'm not sure if Iranians are ready for this. Maybe they are. I, I really can't judge. But coming from the outside is really, really difficult because it needs to be from, from your inside. Um, what do you think in the, in the current administration? Well, we just changed the administration. But if you see foreign politics for the next three years, and you mentioned the issues with Biden, do you think the U.S. is really at a place where we can make a lot of difference? Don't you think that to an extent we should let it go? And that there was, I don't know if you read Peter Zian. Peter Zian has this, and he's, he's very active in the, in the DC circles. He basically has this book where he says it's inevitable that the U.S. will retreat from its global empire, so to speak. We have um, combat-ready soldiers in a hundred different countries. We have lots of military bases. We we have uh, this whole global trade that we spawn that kind of doesn't really matter anymore. There's now COVID, so people, everyone is retreating, and the U.S. will retreat into their own borders more or less. Um, do you believe that's going to happen, um, especially with the current administration or with the new incoming administration? Or do you think we will continue to push the limits there? I just, I can tell you that I hope it's not going to happen because the world is still as it is. Um, there's us, our allies, and there are bad elements. And we have to be there. We have to be ready. We have to be strategic. Uh, you mentioned North Korea. I think that's a very good example. We want to avoid the North Korea example for Iran at any cost. This is very important. I mean, as we are negotiating, and I think this is going to happen where the Biden administration will be negotiating a deal with Iran, there must be a consideration of a military solution to end that issue. Because having a nuclear Iran is just going to push other countries in the region to have a nuclear arm race that we cannot afford to have. Um, we, those are governments that we don't know what happens to them in the future. Um, there's China that wants to support Iran militarily. Um, and, you know, when we talk about China, this is another issue that we have to approach long term. Um, you know, in terms of, for example, if we talk about China, it's a communist regime that is exploiting the capitalist system of the world. A cap an honest, open capitalist system that is fair competition, when you have a regime that is a communist regime that is exploiting that system, I think we have to come to a place where, in my opinion, and I'm not an expert on economy, <laughs> to have a global initiative so we can become less dependent on China to start looking at countries around the world and see where it's underdeveloped countries, developing countries based on their um, natural resources, uh, their uh, human resources, and see where we can, maybe it will be painful in the beginning to have some um, kind of rely on them to manufacture different things. Why are we putting our eggs in China's basket when we know that they're going to be using everything we have there against us short, medium, or long-term. Um, there must be a global approach where we have only other uh, democracies and countries that want to ally with the West, with the United States, with all the countries that actually believe in capitalism and having this open market that where we would 
help other countries that would really need to have these manufacturers open in there, um, where they're, they're just, we will actually even out the production and the prosperity in the world that way. And we, we will protect ourselves long-term from this type of regime that is just basically waiting out and been just planning things and been uh, cheating the system. So we have to make these adjustments. We have to think of these threats like present, medium, and long-term. And I believe the immediate thing is to make sure that the Iranian regime um, does not get a nuclear weapon like North Korea, which does not make the world a safer place today to have a, a crazy person in a very, very closed down dictatorship um, have a nuclear weapon. I mean, this is not the world that we want to have. So we have to really just think of things long term and, OK, we can talk, we can negotiate a deal, but we have to make sure that while we're negotiating that deal, there's no nuclear weapon that's going to come out in the end of it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's obviously a huge, huge risk there. I, I've i been surprised that the the amount of, of violence and wars in the Middle East has been relatively contained the last 20 years. And I'm not really sure what the, the sudden effect is. I mean, since 9-11, I would have expected a huge explosion of violence. I mean, there's American soldiers everywhere, right? They are a target in the Middle East. But it, I mean, there's violence, but the, it seems to be much more limited than, than I initially thought. And um, what what I feel is like, and, and I'm, I'm interested. What you think about China? There's a book. Unfortunately, I forgot the title of it. I, I read a really long time ago, about 30 years ago, and it basically made that argument that every country that the U.S. gets as an ally will sooner or later develop a bit of a superiority complex if it already has a little bit of one. Like Germany had a huge one, China has a huge one, Japan has one, um, Russia has one. Maybe not as crazy. And these countries, Israel has one. Um, so these countries, typically what they do, they become allies of the U.S. or Turkey has one, right? And they become allies of the U.S. and sooner or later, they want more out of this relationship. And once this happens, they turn against the U.S. And I think this is the point where we are now with China. China, we, we profit a lot from China just because they do manufacture really well and they do it cheaply. Even if they never buy our product, it's still good for us, strangely enough. So economic theory is kind of weird in this. Even if they cheat the whole time and don't have imports, restricted from the US, it's still good for us. Um, it would be better if they let our products in, but it's still good if they're cheap manufacturing base. And what I'm, I'm trying to get at is, so this author predicted that we, we will have a constant struggle between the allies and former allies of the US. And eventually when they are allies like China was for the last 20, 30 years, you're kind of more in an economic way than in a political way, but you know, they were the biggest source of manufactured products and they were buying a lot of stuff. They bought all our uh, treasury bonds. There's this theory that they will become sooner or later en engulfed in a hot war with the United States because they feel superior, because they feel like they have been held down by the US. And the theory is, um, when, when you follow this, is that there's going to be a hot war with China in the next 10 to 15 years. And that will spread with the assistance of China, maybe Turkey, with the assistance of Russia to China, um, Turkey, and maybe will also play a part in the Middle East. Have you thought about this? Is that like a, a thing that a lot of people are worried about that? And when uh, worried about when you talk to them, um, what's, your, what's your, your gut feeling about China? Will it be a hot war or will it be more like an Iran proxy war that they give money to someone else and they try to stir up some trouble with the U.S.? Um, I mean, you mentioned a few countries when you just talked, and I think like there's a very clear line to draw between the, the distinction between these countries. When you said Japan, uh, Germany, Israel, um, and then you said Turkey, Russia, uh, China, democracies are democracies. So Japan, uh, Germany, Israel, these are democracies. They have innovations. They have, they're very advanced technologically. Uh, they're not breaking any international rules or agreements. Uh, they're just really a part of the international community. When you talk about Russia, I mean, this is a dictatorship that is, you know, ruled by a dictator um, with a lot of blood on his hands. And there's not a lot of technological advancements from there. The same with Turkey. Turkey benefits from the fact that it's an ally of the United States. It's an important ally. It's a NATO ally. But we have today a dictatorship in Turkey, unfortunately. And that's something we have to deal with. 
China is another country that only it wasn't an American ally. It was just a country that benefited from the United States forgiveness, uh, allowing them to get away with stealing technology, with not uh, being uh, basically following the rules of the international law of any trade agreements of any. So, and at the same time, standing against the United States on every vote in the United Nations Security Council. I mean, it was just allowed to get away with murder over and over and over again. I think this is time. And I'm very thankful for the uh, Trump's administration for this, that the United States stood up to, to China. Now, do I want to have a hot war with China? Absolutely not. I don't think this is the right approach. Um, it's definitely a, a medium and long-term strategy where you would have to shift the market. It's just basically shifting that market, not allowing them to continue to grow more powerful just because we are open and uh, and we have a very um, fair trade system and capitalism is about opportunities or providing opportunities, but we have to be actually more thinking long-term. Okay, we do benefit in the short term from having this relationship from China, but are we in the end just feeding and creating a monster that's not that's gonna uh, threaten everything that we know on this planet. Absolutely, we have to look at the future. We can't just look at now and the immediate and short term profit and ignore what's gonna happen in the future. So, I absolutely believe that we have to have a long term strategy on China, and it should not be depending on who is the administration in the White House. Um, and it has to be a global approach by us and our allies and the, all the companies that um, care about the future of this planet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely, it's very difficult. There's so many scenarios and there's a lot of things that, that make that prediction very hard where this, this whole development of China is going. Because I feel like the U.S. had a, a certain hope that the economic um, improvement in China, which definitely happened, would lead to kind of like a Taiwan, a mini Taiwan, a bigger but mini in terms of it's not as advanced in terms of um, its own cultural development or let's say Western value development, cultural development is not right. Um, that's what the US policy was, right? And a lot of people are disappointed. It turned out the other way. Um, we basically, as you say, that's kind of the feeling. We, we made our enemy stronger and uh, gave them a lot of more power and, and money that they now use globally against us. So it's kind of like a like a Russia approach um, or a problem that we had with Russia right during the Cold War. And uh, the same author also predicted, you know, forget about what's going on with politics, forget about policies, it's all day to day things. In the end, what matters is, and it's also true for religions, he said, <clears throat> whoever is able to create enough innovation, enough productivity growth, is sooner or later win all wars. Now, if you're really small, now you can be overrun and everyone is wiped out and you know that's the end of story. But if you have a certain critical mass, and I would put this at say 10 million people, somewhere the size of Israel, as long as you produce enough innovation and increase productivity growth, which makes you much more valuable in the eyes of others, um, you sooner or later win all the wars. There's no two ways about this because um, any war, like the, the Second World War, the First World War, they were all about who was the most advanced economy in terms of mass output, not just, you know, we, we have five computer chips that we can do, but a mass output and how can we keep this going over a long enough time frame and then you win all the wars. So I think the question is more, and this, this, this bigger topic is, it doesn't really matter what we do with China, right? In the end, we need to produce a healthy economy that keeps on growing. And this is where I am concerned. Just in the last podcast, I, I talked to Jay Zhao, which, which he is originally from mainland China. He's now at Silicon Valley VC. And I, we talked about China, and he's obviously very conflicted. Um, he grew up in mainland China. There's a lot of family there. And he said, um, you know, it's, it's, I remarked that as we, we talked about that, it seems like China is in many ways more entrepreneurial, more open to technology adoption as many places in the U.S. Now, Texas and Florida is different, um, but many places in the coastal U.S. have become very anti-technology. Do you think this is going to continue? Because what, what I feel, and this is why I'm so concerned, it's partly the reason why I'm on this podcast so much, is... I feel like if we don't keep up these entrepreneurial values, then the future will really darken. This is like the core, the, the, the end is, and some of what we have now, you can be really poor now, like China was 20 years ago, or Ethiopia is right now. If you get this productivity growth going, you're going to be the richest country on the planet in a matter of 25 years, definitely within someone's lifetime. 
do you feel we, we're beginning to lose this in the US or do you think it's just, just you know, data to your politics, but the actual, what you actually see from people when you go outside the belt, um, it's very different. And this is all the technological progress in the US and the adoption is good to go. Um, I know that a lot of people don't like the word globalization, um, but I think we need to look, start looking at the world as one world. You know, we could not just look at only ourselves and think of, okay, so we are not, I think even like now with the pandemic of what happened, I think the survival is for the countries that adapt the fastest, that adapt to change, that are willing to conform with the changing world that we live in. And we need to look outside of our own, you know, area. There are so many other countries where we could empower uh, their I mean, not like only the United States, I'm not like it's saying the United States should do everything, right? Because that's also another thing that is becoming an, an issue. But we have to start looking at the entire planet and see how we can adapt and how we can change and how, where could we rely on for different technologies, for different uh, advancements, for, um, you know, resources and shift our... Um, the, all of the extra um, help that we were giving to countries that do not serve us in the long run. And um, so, I mean, technology is very important as a religious person. You know, we, this is the world that God gave us. And I, I know that in the end of the day, in my opinion, if we think that science is going to answer all the questions, we are very, very arrogant. Um, but definitely science is part of what we were giving on this planet. And people who are the fastest to explore, adapt, and again, you know, kind of mold with the changing world are the ones who are to survive in the end. A country like China that has always been just on the receiving end of stealing somebody else's invention and making it first because they just can because there's no laws to prevent them because the regime over there facilitates whatever they need to facilitate to make things happen the fastest they can happen unlike other countries where there's a democracy there's a system capitalism there's a competition you know to who is going to do it first so there's it's it's a different way of, of doing things but there, we have other, I mean, we can just expand the horizon of where we're looking at, where we can do this, and how we can just kind of go towards a future where a, a one evil regime does not possess the, the strings to all of these very important things that concern the humanity and, and our future as, as people. Um, the same thing for the people in China. I mean, there are all of the, you know, we talk about the Uyghurs. And the genocide that's happening against them, I mean, I really truly believe that we should have a global initiative to help these people. Obviously, the people of Hong Kong, my heart breaks as somebody who grew up under a dictatorship to see these people are now losing the democracy and freedom that they've enjoyed for so long. It's such a heartbreaking story. Taiwan is another country that we must do everything to protect. But at the same time, we need to pull our uh, all of these benefits that we were giving to this country that's undeserving of them um, and just put them elsewhere. We just have to do those things. Yeah, I think you, you're you overestimating the, 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 uh, the impact of policy there. And I think what, what China is going through, in all fairness, um, I share no love for the communist regime. You know, I, I, that's kind of the, the one of the worst things you can you can put in front of my face. But on the other hand, um, the, the the development cycle of copying other people's technology and product, then innovating slowly or quickly, and then producing something better, producing a brand. That's something every single country in the world has done. As it was the true story of Taiwan, it was the story of Japan, it was the story of Germany, it was the story of the U.S. when they came out of England. So this is the way to develop, and there is obviously a gray zone there. And uh, it's but did obviously... It, sorry to interrupt you, Thorsten. Did they do it, uh, because you just said it, they did it better. They probably, in China, it's like they're doing it worse, but they're doing it cheaper and quicker. So it's not well, really... That's, that's the same as better. That's the same as better in economic terms. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's just it's like a worse system. It's yeah. worse scene, but it's just faster and cheaper, and it's violating the right of whoever invented it first. So I'm just... Yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of like patent and copyrights. I have my own, my own fights about that. Um, 
so what what I'm, what I wanted to get at is we 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 I think the solution in this is not to be hostile to China, which is maybe maybe um, necessary at some point, right? Or be be very aggressive against China. But I think this is this is a little bit too emotional in that sense, and I, I, it might be warranted, right? I'm I'm, I'm with you in, in the, the way you describe the problem, but I think that the the easier solution for everyone involved is just out compete. The same that happened to Russia, right? We could have we could have tried to bomb Russia or the Soviet Union, and it wouldn't have ended well for anyone involved, right? Even if we had, we would have won in the end, it would have been not a planet you want to live on. So the solution was for us to outcompete them, and I think this was official solu- official policy for quite some time, especially in the 60s when it was so close with the Cuba crisis. So for a lot of these wars, and I'm not saying we should never be in a war, um, I'm not a pacifist, but I'm saying we, if we can avoid a war by outcompeting people, and even if, you know, we can't actually, in the end, we can't control what China does. We can try with some international policy, and you're right. I mean, there is some levers you can pull, but this bureaucracy is so slow. Um, say we, we talk about quantum computing and, and uh, AGI. If these things happen in China quickly and much quicker than in the U.S., so we're going to be light years behind, which is just a matter of two years. By the time the U.N. doesn't even know what, what's going on, nobody in the U.N. knows what AGI is and what impact it could have on humanity. So these technologies, in the end, we need to be first. And I think this is a lesson, and I feel like if we can can use this this inspiration to get a more entrepreneurial state of being for 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 this generation going, and um, Daniel was mentioning this, um, he said every generation needs a moral crisis, and I feel in the '80s it was you know nuclear war is is happening tomorrow, or even in the '70s when I was born. And this generation now, their moral crisis is everything is racist, right? But that's that's propaganda. I mean, maybe it's true in certain instances, and probably it is true, but that's not how we create a forward-looking, positive policy of strong economic growth. I mean, maybe we do, right? Let's not put it this way. But I think what's what's going on right now is this end of the long cycle of, of EU's dominance. And we need to renew it, or we're going to lose it, right? Because we're always challenged by someone, and now we have a real big challenger. And I feel if we could just create out of these policy proposals that you had, if we could create a positive economic policies in the sense of we get this generation to be as, gen- as entrepreneurial and get our productivity growth up, then these, these problems will go away by themselves. We don't have to worry much. In 20 years, we're going to be by far the biggest and most advanced economy on the planet. And everyone else will just, like you said, Israel is now in the Middle East. Everyone will have a piece of this technology and we can we can put our values attached to these technology, but if we just have the values but no productivity advantage, then I don't think it's going to look so good for the U.S. I agree with you, and I do not advocate for a war with China. I said it very clearly. I know I talk in a way that is more emotional, (laughs) but I do not believe that this is the solution. I definitely don't say that it is different than when the Soviet Union, because China is playing both worlds. So it's a communist regime, but it's exploiting capitalism. That's, so it's a more complicated problem than the Soviet yeah. Union. I agree that we have to think of a long-term approach of how to offset the balance again, where um, the West and democracies have the upper hand in technology and advancements and um, just be uh, ahead. So yes, this is, but I'm just saying that this is something to think about. This is a, a global issue that uh, there should be more uh, thought and time and focus and energy put into this. Um, and, you know, I'm just hoping that there, this is in, is in place at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you, when you, when you give me your own perspective, how much do you think these the foreign policy within an administration, right? When you when you talk to people that are part of a larger um, administration, how much do you think foreign policy is is real policy? Like it's actually changing the lives of people quickly, and how much of that is a bit of a and that's my gut feeling sometimes. Foreign policy is a bit like and you said that earlier. You come up with a foreign enemy. Then you blame that foreign enemy. Then you create a policy, and just because it's a, it's a topic that people can can attach themselves emotionally to, you kind of use foreign policy as a bit of a virtue signaling to get people in line. Um, like climate change is on the left, right? You you say, oh, we're all going to be dead in twelve years, and you know, I I grew up with the with the ozone layer, and we're all going to be not able to go outside in less than ten years. That was in the nineties, a very normal discussion. And I was a very strong lefty in the 90s. So I was, I was, I was singing the same praise and I felt I can never go outside again. 
which if we have still have um, destroyed the ozone layer, obviously it didn't happen. Fortunately, it didn't happen. And the same is kind of true with climate change. It brings people in line. But do you think the foreign policy often, I mean, you talk to other leaders of other countries or foreign policy advocates of other countries, do you think that's a consistent issue and maybe we are making the same mistake? Or do you think that's only related to certain regimes that actually use it purely as a propaganda tool, but in general, foreign policy is real? Um, no, absolutely. We definitely have foreign policy is real. We have different um, administrations that carried out different policies, different belief sets. I mean, uh, like, like you just mentioned, I, I would, I, what my problem is, is the, the very kind of big gap in terms of foreign policy between one administration and another. You know, you see the approach is just very, very kind of like all the way on the other side. I don't think this is healthy. Um, as a person, I care about policies and actions of administrations rather than people. I know a lot of people did not like Trump. He's a provocative person. He is not a, a usual president. He does not say the right thing. I mean, I, I understand. I completely understand the, those uh, beliefs. But this administration had carried out policies that were for the best interest of the United States and for our allies. That's my belief. That's what I've seen. Um, then you you get a different administration, a demo, uh, you know, a democratic administration. This I don't know if that was as severe before, um, but it is happening uh, today. And I'm just um, it's concerning to see the approach because, again, dictatorships respond to force, respond to strength. And when you get an administration that is seems soft, that is se seems like, oh, we're just going to talk, that just immediately empowers these regimes. They feel the, the power of, oh, nobody's going to stop us now. We can get away with everything. So then you get more trouble, more problems. Um, so I do believe, I mean, there's, but, you know, the climate change. I mean, why, did, why is it a left and right uh, question? I don't know. I happen to be center on so many issues and conservative on other issues. Um, I voted for Hillary Clinton in the first election. I did not vote for Donald Trump because I just was like, who is this guy? You know, I'm naturally I would vote Republican. Uh, but Donald Trump, to me, was not a Republican. Uh, I didn't know who he, who he was. I didn't know what he stood for. Um, he was also, I mean, an isolationist, which is what Obama was, which I do not like. I felt like Hillary would be the, the one thing, like she would represent something in the middle, more a traditional American, uh, you know, kind of more center left. So that was that was the choice. So, I mean, it's not really about people it's about policies i just i think it's you you want to choose what you believe would be best for the country and um under the previous administration we had a really good economy until the pandemic hit um we have to just really wait and see what this administration is going to do and how they're going to be handling all of these different uh threats and issues that are awaiting for this administration in an ever-changing world as we're speaking, the world is changing. It's just a matter of us looking at it and, and realizing these changes and doing the right thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your, your sincerity. And the, but the, the feeling I have, and you, you're part of that industry, I'm part of that industry to an extent, right? So we can be honest. Um, I feel there is a lot of theater to it. Politics, you want to sell an idea, but you, you kind of make up things that you don't really necessarily believe in, but you just want to be voted in office, right? Uh, maybe you believe them, maybe not, but it's very difficult sometimes to tell the difference. And uh, what what I always felt is that the 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 the, uh, the actual impact of policies is is really overestimated. And you know, there, there is obviously that's maybe too too much um, too broad a statement. But think about what what Obama wanted to do, right? He came in and he said, "I'm going to meet with everyone. No, no, no um, preconditions." He wanted to do meet with North Korea, it didn't happen. He wanted to meet with Iran. I don't know if it actually happened. I think not on a presidential level. Um, and he basically said, everyone who wants to talk to me should talk to me and I'm willing to travel anywhere. And he did, right? Um, but it, not a lot of actual high level discussions came out of it. And then uh, there was this policy to give Iran a lot of money and a lot of leeway, right? Um, I don't know how many billions it was. It was a considerable amount of money and the lifting of restrictions, but that was something the Europeans also wanted to do. 
But this money would have come from Russia if it wouldn't have come from the U.S. or would have come from Germany. Someone would have given Iran money just in the hope that this money would, would do the trick. It didn't, right? So I feel like irrespective of what, what the concrete policy was, there is a bigger, a bigger effect behind it. And these, these geopolitics, they kind of play out irrespective of policies in the specific moment. Um, Iran is going to be a problem for this administration and for the next one and for the one after, right? Until there is a solution. And this can only come from the Iranian people, I feel. Um, I hope I hope not. I truly hope not. I don't really think that time could be extended as like for that long. Because if we're talking about the Iran problem and the nuclear Iran question being a problem of this administration and the next one and the next one, next, that means Iran has a nuclear weapon. I mean, that's what that means. And yeah. that would mean that other countries in the region also have nuclear weapons. And this is not good news for anybody in the world that cares about the security of the Middle East, about the prosperity of the Middle East, about the future and the prosperity of the world as we know it. So this is very serious. I definitely think that Obama came in with an, with an isolationist perspective. Um, as a person, I don't think Obama actually cared for our allies or really believed in the American uh, role in the world. He wanted the United States to retreat. He went to Cuba and danced tango to show up while the Cubans were being murdered on the streets and they were being picked up by the Castro regime. Um, he was forgiving with Iran and gave Iran the upper hand and, and allowed them to continue sponsor terrorism and kill innocent people all over the Middle East because he was like, you know, let's just negotiate the deal. Like, this is not our place to to be the, the cop of everybody. A lot of people said this this policy drove uh, the United Arab Emirates to the accords that we have with Israel and to Saudi Arabia. Because if Iran wouldn't have prospered so much uh, geopolitically in that moment, they wouldn't have never agreed to that opening towards Israel, which just happened, right? So if the, the mega trend is in intention. Uh, <laughs> he didn't no, it was he intentional, didn't, of course not. But that's what I'm trying to say. People's intentions and the outcomes of of these big these big games, because in the end it's it's a it's all game theory. It doesn't really depend on your actions so much. It's like the prisoner's dilemma, right? I mean, you can't control the outcome, even if you can control yourself, because there's another person in the other room which can mess up whatever you're doing. So that's what I'm trying to say. The the original policy is a good intended, bad intended, whatever. The, the the whole game of politics kind of plays on and it, it is much more the, the actual driver is, is is economic growth. If if you have economic growth, you can buy up everyone. It's kind of what Germany does, right? So Germany didn't have a real army for a long time and it's basically dysfunctional. So what they've been really good at is giving everyone a big check because they had so much money, the biggest economy in Europe. So they basically opened a checkbook and bought everyone, and that works for a long time, right? Until someone says, Oh no, we can just take it. That hasn't happened yet. What do you mean by like but everyone. What does that mean? Well, that is the, that was kind of the same thing in Iran, right? So they, they, Germany was a driver of this besides France, and they said, well, why don't we give you a lot of money, and then you just don't have nuclear weapons anymore, and we maybe enforce it, maybe not, but we hope for the best. And they've been done... The, mm -hmm. Germany and France were against the Iran nuclear deal, and it took the United States to actually convince specifically France to join, because... Yeah, France is more hawkish than Germany, but Germany has been doing this for forever. They've done this with Poland initially. They've done this with Russia, and they they build a huge pipeline with Russia. And you you feel like, whoa, this is really strange. I mean, they seem to really think that giving money not to NATO but everyone else is the way to buy your friendship. And so far, it has worked, right? I don't know if it's it's a long term strategy, but so far, it has definitely worked. I I agree that uh, our European allies have been very just kind of thinking about the moment and each uh, government is worried about its next elections and no one is just really thinking about the long game. Um, and this is, I think, one of democracy's flaws, right? Is that you get an administration, you get a government and all it cares about is resolving the problems of now and getting elected for the next term. So no we need dictators, maybe. The future of the, the country. I agree. And this is a real problem. And the autocratic solution, you know, the dictator, so to speak, and there could be a benevolent dictator. It doesn't have to be malevolent, right? So when you, when you think this through, you actually end up with an autocrat or a dictator for a certain time with a term limit, say a term limit of 20 years, kind of like Singapore, right? When you think, think this through, 
as this is very risky, but these people can really change the game, as China has shown, right? They are definitely a dictatorship, but they've shown how they quickly they've changed China. I think most citizens are actually better off than 20 years ago. Not the ones who died, but everyone else. I know, but the Chinese citizens, I mean, don't have, they hardly have enough money to eat. They work so long, they get really little benefits. But it's better than 20 years ago. You go to China, these cities look like, they're way more modern than any American city, even the third tier cities. It's, it's incredible. It is incredible, but the people didn't benefit as much as they should have. I mean, there is still... I don't know. I mean, they, they were bought kind of by the they were bought by the Chinese regime, right? We give you money, we give you prosperity, but never question us. And it worked in Singapore. It worked in a lot of different places, but it's very risky. I, I agree with you. Well, Singapore, is that, I mean, I'm not sure about like the government system in Singapore, but is that uh, not a democracy? It's total dictatorship. It is. But it is a prosperous yeah. country. So yes, you have a point to this. Um, I'm not sure about how, where did that, you know, does that country stand in terms of its alliances uh, with the U.S. allies, with Western countries, because in the world there are forces for good and forces for bad. I agree that there's like not a very kind of black and white clear line on, oh, so if this country is a dictatorship, doesn't have the elections, that, oh my God, it's pure evil. Because like you said, this is an example of a country that prospered, that its citizens are living a good life. They have the, all of the basic necessities, human rights, and needs to excel in this world and in their lives. Um, so yes, there is a lot of questions and debate to kind of keep talking about the, the difference there. Like what is what is good and what's not good? Because like you said, we can go to a country, um, I don't know, Afghanistan, and just ask people to vote and see who they would vote for. And they might end up voting for an extremist regime. They might not. But it, it is it is an interesting uh, question. Um, I think it, what, I, what I said again is it comes down to the people's beliefs and the life that they're living on a daily basis. Working themselves to death, which is what I've been kind of reading about, uh, about China, people who work themselves to death, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's... But you can go to any Chinatown in a major U.S. city and there's a lot of Chinese working themselves to death, living in freedom. Like, this is a cultural trait. It's not, I mean, that's true, they do, but that's a cultural trait to work 90, day, 90 hours a week because you want to make your children better off. And maybe there's not, maybe there's nothing really else you care about. They're just culturally pre-programmed to do this. Not everyone who's Chinese, but there's a definitely a, um, they tend towards working more than anyone else. And they obviously earn more in many places, right? I mean, I think Chinese Americans are some of the highest earning categories, or if you sort by race, which I think is stupid. But if you do that, they, they are doing this very well and for good reason, because it's what they choose, right? Some people choose to work hard. Other people, like Germans, they go to beaches and work 30 hours a week, and they're fine with this, right? Everyone in study philosophy, everyone has a different approach. So some people end up being richer and some are poorer, which is fine, as long as they respect each other to an extent. So it comes down to the to the system that is ruling, right? I rather not live in a country that people have to work till death. I just don't think this is okay. I don't think this should be accepted. Um, again, you know, yes, we understand that different cultures have different things, but there definitely must be a government in place that sets rules and laws to protect its people, to make sure they don't work themselves to death, and that they can continue to provide to their family and have a healthy, long life. So those are the things I think where, you know, oh. the <laughs> Have you been to Taiwan? It's just anecdotal, but have you been to Taiwan? They're very, they're very, um, they're very Chinese, um, so to speak, uh, much more than Hong Kong. So, but they're, they're very friendly folks. I mean, not like the mainlanders. They always harp, harp on the mainlanders because they're not friendly enough. Anyways, what I wanted to say is, because you said that you want to be old, the, what you see in Taiwan is the oldest people you've ever seen anywhere. People, everyone is like 110 and they are all half naked and they walk through the city. They're not homeless, right? They just live in, 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 in the place, they're in their residence and then they walk outside, they sit outside or do some mechanical work. I've never seen so many old people there are not just old, they're like beyond old and they look fit, right? They're, they're all skinny and they're like well tanned and that's how they spent their, their 50 years of retirement. I don't even know when they retire, they all do something, right? But I've never seen so many old people so publicly in your face, half naked all the time. That's when you go through Taipei and probably also outside of Taipei and Taiwan. So, and it's a free country, right? So it's different. 
it's a free country. Tell me more about their their uh, government in place because that's a really good example, right? Yeah. It's like an island uh, by itself. Yeah, I mean, Taiwan is Taiwan is in, in any respect awesome. It's very competitive. It's a very um, very democratic country. It's it's kind of the opposite of what what the mainland China is, and the the rift between um, the experience. When you go to mainland, um, you have a lot of really grumpy people uh, that work very hard, but they're really grumpy and they don't they don't believe in God. Um, they don't believe in anything because uh, how could you, right? If you believe in something, it will just make you vulnerable. And in Taiwan, it's the complete opposite. You have a very friendly people. You have a everything is really cheap, but it's really good quality. You know, it's one of the cheapest countries in Eastern Asia, way cheaper than Japan or China itself now. And you have this high quality of service everywhere, and you have people who who definitely seem settled and and very positive. And uh, that is night and day. I mean, these are exactly the same people, but right? they have the same ancestors until 50, 60 years ago, and it's night and day difference. It's like North Korea and South Korea couldn't be bigger the difference. Eastern or Western Germany was the same thing. So I'm totally with you, but it has to come out of people's, it, it somehow needs to get in people's minds that this is, a regime is evil, get rid of it. And my theory, even I've been to 130 countries, and you might correct me on this, but my experience was always people kind of have, not immediately in that moment, but over time, they have the regime that they deserve. And that sounds, that sounds harsh and cruel, but I feel like if, if the people choose to be better governed, they would have chosen better. They, they do it without you. They don't need the U.S. for this. They could just fire whoever leads them. Um, I just, you know, this whole thing when we talk about, oh, regime change and, oh my God, this is like such a, you know, negative word in the, in the United States, you know, now like that we're, you know, talking to American audience. I, I'm not like, the, the approach should never be, oh, let's go and do a regime change war. But definitely we have a role to play in supporting the people's uh, abilities to make those changes on their own. Um, so, you know, we should not be in a place to empower uh, evil regimes. We should not, just period. I mean, this should be like where we, we stop because this is just not the, good for the world. Whatever happens, you know, in the end of the day, we are living in one small world. And we are going to a place where someday this whole world, I mean, is is eventually one. I know people don't like to hear this, but this is the... So you're you know, globalist. It's. I would not even call it globalist. I it's a strange word, very strange word. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by it. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting to. You want to be global on one hand, but it's become a bad word over time. It, it has become a bad word. That's why I would not use it. I'm just saying that we are, whether we like it or we don't, we are heading towards a place where it's just everything is just going to be so interconnected. I mean, we are. That's that's the destiny of humanity. I mean, that's my belief. Um, I know it could be very spiritual, it could be biblical, you know, but this is where we're going. Um, I just believe that we have a role to play. We should not be passive. We should not be at least in a place where we empower these regimes. Um, like you said, you know, the people in the end, they will decide how this ends, but we should do our part and just protecting our interests, our uh, allies, and uh, the things that we stand for, our values. That's yeah. what the world needs to survive. Well, I, you know, that's probably the last thing I, I'm going to torment you with. But it, well, we had these policies in Pakistan and Afghanistan, so we didn't want to put troops on the ground. So we said, oh, let's use the drones. And then obviously they produce a lot of collateral damage because in the end it's bombs that we kind of randomly throw at people. And then we produce a lot of hate um, for America that's actually real because people use their relatives for no reason, right? Maybe we killed the terrorists, but we also killed a lot of innocent people. And that sooner or later, I mean, if you do this constantly, it creates a lot of backlash against the U.S. What do you think is kind of the, the best foreign policy tool that doesn't that doesn't make that doesn't create a lot of negative negativity against the U.S.? Is it for, from what would you see? I mean, there's policy, but how do you enact policy? Right? You either have boots on the ground, or you give people money, you buy them off. There is, I feel, a limited amount of options to really change people's behavior. What is your current favor, favorite? Would you say, well, we make a policy and we kind of do it a moral imperative? I think that's maybe the third avenue. What are your your favorite tools? Obviously, you said war is not your favorite. Mm -hmm. Yes, and absolutely. Uh, I believe that the United States should not be pulling out of places where other elements that are bad could fill in that, that space. 
So I, because now we are in places. So in my opinion, pulling out is not going to be helpful. What do you mean bases? But people don't leave the bases anymore. Most American bases are very restricted. They don't really leave in many countries where, where they don't, where kind of hostile, hostile forces. <laughs> so I agree with you in, ter in terms of Afghanistan. You know, that, that's a debate where some people want the United States to pull out. I mean, the question to me would be, what will happen when the United States pulls out? Who will fill in that gap? If that's going to be another area where we're going to have other bad forces that are somehow going to attack our allies and attack us in the future, then we should not be leaving. That would be my simple, straightforward answer. Now, yeah. if there are ways for us to also uh, invest globally, again, like have our allies also be involved in, in changing the educational system and facilitating and helping these people in these countries that disagree with the Taliban, that disagree. And actually, let me tell you something, person. When Obama was in the White House and the United States kind of retreated from a lot of countries, you can tell immediately how these people of these countries are terrified because they do not want the United States to leave. People here think that, oh, the United States is just like occupying countries. But the people of these countries do not want the United States to leave because the alternative is really scary and it's actually evil and they end up getting killed. So uh, to me, it's about education. We need to help that those countries in one way or the other, empower the pro Uh, democracy, pro-human rights elements within these countries. So in the long run, we're not just leaving for the Taliban to take over. I mean, we have to, we have, to have a long-term approach where we empower the good guys yeah. and let the bad guys softly cade until they die out, die out, which is what they deserve to do because the, the people don't want them because they're basically just, you know, they're drug dealers, they're murdering their citizens. They should not be in power. You know, one thing that I was thinking about now that we print so much money is we, we, when you look back, one of the probably maybe accidental, but one of the most successful policy initiatives was the Marshall Plan. When you look back and that created obviously on the ruins of Second World where everyone was, was craving for cash in Europe and beyond. And that really, it felt like we, we bought a lot of friends, right? We, we, we made sure that these allies are designed in our system. But we give them so much money that nobody could refuse it. I wonder if we can just print a couple of trillion, go to the Middle East, go to all these trouble spots and say, you know, this is what we want you to do. And these are the milestones. And you get like a billion every day as long as you do this. Um, kind of what we did in Iraq, right? It, it, it kind of didn't work so well. But I, I felt like, like an, a, a nation building that's completely voluntary, right? Without going there and having troops on the ground, because that's always going to be pretty nasty. Imagine we had like a bunch of French troops and Russian troops and Iranian troops in DC. You would be like, hmm, this is weird. I mean, even if they don't do anything and if they're there for the good, you're like, okay, these people shouldn't be there. Like, nobody can deny that. And that's kind of what, what I feel would really make change the game. But like the examples you're using just, just don't fit because you're talking about a democracy where there's dictatorships will send forces to a democracy to save it somehow. It's not like, I mean, this is not the case when you're talking about the U.S. I don't, I don't see the clear distinction between dictatorship and democracy. I don't see it. Um, I mean, there is something to it, but it's not as clear. <laughs> how, how do you not see like the difference between the regime in Russia and the United States? As right, but No, I mean, I, I, I'm very familiar with the political philosophy, but the, 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 how it breaks down for the individuals, especially short term, we're not talking about 200 years, we're talking about 10 years or 20 years, the differences are not that huge. And American democracy, and you know, I don't know, we, we cannot talk about this because then this, this YouTube video ends up being banned. But there's, I have my own theories of what, what happened in the last couple of elections, not just the last one, the last four or five elections. Um, Anyway, so you were saying, so democracy is different, but would that kind of a new Marshall Plan, do you think that would be useful? Or that's, we do this anyways, but we, we can't scale this up right now. I mean, look, when we talk about the Iraq war, there were so many mistakes that were done. Things should have been done differently, but that does not take away the fact that the Iraqi people wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein. I mean, you just have to be yeah. very clear. We've had the Syrian regime and the Iranian regime who start sending uh, terrorist extremists into Iraq and have commit suicide bombings, kill Iraqis, kill American soldiers to make sure that Iraq would be a failed 
experiment by the United States. And until today, with that destruction continues, today there was two suicide bombings in Baghdad that killed so many people. I mean, my heart breaks for the people in, in this region just because we, the, everybody is continuing to pay for the price. And I think the specifically why we have been is because we've had after the Bush's administration, we've had the Obama administration that came in and were like, oh, we're going to fix the, the mistake. We're just going to pull our troops out as if that was the solution. And then what happened? We've had ISIS because these Sunnis who were oppressed by the Shiite extremist groups who were just slaughtering Sunnis just because they were Sunnis with the help of the Iranian regime. Um, basically, extremism became their way. And that's what happens. You just have bad elements that will come out of because there's a vacuum, because there's bad forces that are steering and empowering extremism and hate and war. So the solution is never to just walk away. There's always other solutions. There are ways where we could protect our interests and help the people of these countries uh, and make sure that well, there's not bad elements and bad forces that are coming to fill in that gap. And I think and I hope that Biden, well, he was the vice president of Obama at the time, that he had a, dis a different point of view and that he is not going to be re-implementing those failed policies by the Obama administration in the Middle East. Well, on this positive note, Heavy, I really thank you for, for all your passionate um, um, commentary and, and ideas that you, you've been telling us for the last uh, hour and a half. Thanks a lot for doing this. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Doris. It's great, great to be with you, and uh, I wish you all the best on your show. Pleasure is all on my side. Hope to see you again. Thanks a lot, Avi. Thank you.